On June 9, 2021, 34 members of Minnehaha Academy's Class of 1961 gathered via Zoom for a 60-year reunion. Here are some highlights of the day, and this is the cast. I'm still looking for the little short-haired twerp that impersonated me in this photo. Carl Olson, our class representative, along with Mary Soiny Taylor and eight classmates, organized the three and a half hour Zoom reunion. It was filled with memories, some serious and reflective and many humorous. It also included a video showing classroom D206 the classroom that 30 of our classmates funded for $110,000. Greetings class of 1961. My name is Nathan Johnson and this is my 16th year teaching social studies and coaching debate at Minnehaha. I've been very thankful for those 16 years which have been inspiring and encouraging and enriching for me because of curious students and wise and thoughtful colleagues and alumni who come back for conversation and connection. And in many ways, what's happened in these last several years has been a gift, just like this space that you helped to provide. Uh, and let's look at that space now. Thank you for sponsoring this classroom to help the good work here at Minnehaha continue with a new generation of kids. I may be biased, but you have sponsored the most beautiful room in the school with the best tree views anywhere. Beyond this beauty, the space is where I try to continue in the tradition of Harlan Christensen, who loved kids, was fascinated by the world, sought to serve his community, and ask big questions. We appreciate you, class of 1961. Thank you for this beautiful classroom space. We had some fascinating conversations while all together in one large group, but also broke up into smaller groups to reflect on our days at Minnehaha and reminisce about some of our teachers. You know, I was thinking about one thing that was important at Minnehaha was it was small. We, I think we had one of the largest graduating classes of, mm -hmm. at Minnehaha, but right. actually it was a small group in, compared to other high schools. And I think we got to do so many different things. You could join anything and be in it because it was always a small group. You got leadership positions, you got to participate, you got to go places. And in a larger school, I think it would be more limited and always co competitive to be able to make the team or get on the group it was a neat yeah. thing. So um, I went to Park Avenue Covenant Church and John Braun was the youth pastor at our church. And then he became, and maybe he got chaplain at Minnehaha at the same time. I don't remember how the two jobs overlapped, you know, but he was a big uh, influence in my life and he believed in me a lot, I felt as an adult and encouraged me and challenged me to do more than I would have done 
left on my own. And uh, I think I tried to, uh, you know, meet some of his uh, challenges for me. I think he was a big influence on my life. I guess I have to say my favorite teacher was Guido Calls. Um, I learned that he was a great teacher for teaching German and I, that was my, actually my favorite class. And it's been fun to run into him. I went on one of his trips. We were able to go to the over Amargau mm -hmm. and that was really a neat thing. Mm -hmm. um, the time we were there, at the time when Christ was on the cross, it thundered and lightning. It was kind of effective. I think probably the major influence in my life was uh, probably the religious background at, at uh, Minnehaha. And uh, I, I enjoyed going to the chapel services and hearing, I, I think, uh, a lot of quality preaching. And I, I enjoyed the, uh, the, Bibli the Bible classes. And my interest in, in biblical studies has continued throughout, uh, throughout my life, and it, it hasn't ended. Certainly, teachers had an influence, but I would say in my senior oh. year, the one that had the most influence on me was Jim Carroll. And um, just his character. And he got me started doing uh, debate, <laughs> which I don't think I would have ever done without his uh, recommendation. After Jim died, I saw him two weeks before he passed away. And I was talking to his daughter and Jim got his daughter to go into debate also. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, I think we underestimate the influence that our classmates have on us as well as the teachers. I've always said it was Miss Franklin calls. Um, when we were on the quiver or journalism class, which were the classes that prepared you for being on the quiver staff. And I was chosen as an editor. I was, as, I was more surprised than anybody. And I always thought she saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And I, at this point, you realize now that's the mark of a good teacher. Um, I remember Mr. Olson for one incident, the day that he showed up carrying a pail and the entire bottom of the pail was a cow's eye. He had gone <laughs> to the slaughterhouse that morning and brought a cow's eye. Oh, and no. that is a strong memory. <laughs> In my first year of Latin, Miss Peterson said we could get extra credit at Christmas if we would translate a Christmas song into Latin. Oh. And I thought about it and I thought, you know, I've never heard anyone do Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> so I translated it into Latin and, and I still remember my paper came back and it said A plus, however, I hope you would choose from the sacred repertoire. <laughs> Oh, 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 that is wonderful. But the sequel is that then some years later, on one of the times I was on Prairie Home Companion at Christmas, Garrison Keeler had, he was a little short of time, and, and he, he came off stage and said, does anybody have something that lasts just a minute? I said, well, I can sing Rudolph in Latin. He said, go for it. So I went out, <laughs> sat at the piano, and dedicated it to Evangeline Peterson. Oh, oh, nice. oh good. She was not listening, but later she called and said, I hear my name was on national public radio. <laughs> <laughs> so thrilled. And the last time I sang it for her was in her room at age 102. Oh, and wow. I, she came and she said, I hope you'll sing Rudolph. And I said, Oh, oh wonderful. Right. You know who had the, which teacher had the greatest memory? Margaret Nelson. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. she kept coming in reunions, and she could name everyone in your class. She remembered what year you graduated, all of Cal's classes she remembered. I mean, unbelievable. Along that same line, the last reunion when Margaret Nelson was there. Yeah. She was, as you're saying, Sarmita, she would go into each group and... Yeah, I hardly remember the name, but there yep. was something about that person that they that she remembered. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> she yes. Walked, she walked up to me and she said, "Mary, 
She said, you've gotten shorter. <laughs> <laughs> Just what you wanted to hear, right? <laughs> and I have. So she was correct, but it was kind of like, that was the first thing that came up. <laughs> yeah, how does she remember what you were in high school? <laughs> I don't know, but I thought that was really cute. <laughs> Several classmates mentioned how they enjoyed Harlan Christensen's class. It was he who instructed us to always back up our points of view with quotes from news articles, or especially statements from experts in the field. Dean Sandberg and I complied. I have a question for Dean Sandberg. Yes. Dean, let me ask you, does the name Glenn Finsterwald mean anything to you? What's the name? Glenn Finsterwald. Well, the name is vague. Um, well, let me remind you in that case. <laughs> you and I decided that we wanted to create a fictitious person, and his, we named him Glenn Finsterwald. Oh, well, Glenn God. Finsterwald, it happens, knew everything about everything. So, for yeah. instance, when we wanted to, uh, when we wanted to, uh, to substantiate a statement on geopolitics, it was mm -hmm. because of the that well-known and renowned geopolitician, Glenn Finsterwald. <laughs> or or that, oh, that, that nuclear biologist, Glenn Finsterwald. <laughs> but, and, and I don't know that we ever really used it, but, but every time you and I would look at each other and said, Glenn Finsterwald. That's right. <laughs> you know, that was kind of prophetic, though, because now we call it Google. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. Harlan Christensen and I became buddies. I, um, I was one of uh, maybe fifty Democrats in the school then. I remember <laughs> one day wearing a big button that said, "If I was twenty-one, I'd vote for Clinton or for um, for Kennedy." Yeah, you know, and the combination of him being a Democrat and a Catholic really went over big at Minnehaha. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we try to understand the forces that shape our lives, and I don't know if my parents ever had the dream of sending my brother and me to Minnehaha. I never heard about it until my brother, who's two years older, in ninth grade, he hung out with the wrong crowd and started smoking. And, <laughs> and my parents decided to send him to Minnehaha. That, that was the reason why I was, that's what I think is why I ended up at Minnehaha, because my brother got in trouble. <laughs> Chuck, yes. There were, we had some fine athletes. You were the finest athlete. You, you played so many sports. Yeah. If you had been able so, to play only one sport, what would it have been? I love tennis. I uh, mm -hmm. enjoyed playing that after college and um, played in some local tournaments and um, that was uh, the sport I enjoyed the, the most playing mm -hmm. some tennis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> once, once when Chuck was building tennis courts, the man, the owner wanted to do a benefit for tennis players in the inner city and he got Arthur Ashe to come to his oh. tennis court in Minnetonka. Nice. Back, back many years Arthur Ashe was playing actively, and and so we got on the court with Arthur Ashe. Oh, was I his partner? You were his partner. I mean, I and I froze up. I was hitting the ball over the fence, and <laughs> <laughs> but he said, "I can play with you guys anytime. This is no problem at all." The other thing happened actually in 2016. Uh, we go back to our cruising background, and we ended up on a cruise that had been planned for three years by the cruise company. And it was the first somewhat large ship to do the Northwest Passage. Uh, we went from uh, Alaska, it was 32 days, up way above the uh, Arctic Circle, visited three Inuit villages, uh, all which had to be prearranged through the Canadian government and uh, ended up in New York City. Uh, and did Greenland and some other things. I, I remember with friends being in, on a trip to the south of England, this would have been in 1973, taking the train down to um, see Arundel Castle. And uh, my, I can hardly believe this would have come a, a couple years later when I lived in a town along that train track and uh, lived and worked there for about seven years. I, uh, I, I still think back and can't believe it really happened. But after telling uh, the story of uh, 
of my family's experience of coming to America and what happened before. And we went, uh, I stood in the little church in Regal, Latvia, where my mom and dad mm. carried me in to have me baptized. And I saw mm. the baptismal record. Mm. And I stood in the hospital where mom gave birth to me. Mm. And then in Lubeck, Germany, where we escaped to when Russia invaded Latvia, we, um, I walked the streets of the camp where I lived as a child for five and a half years. Vera, can you talk to us a little bit about your work in the Shoah Project? Yes, the Shoah Project was a project that Steven Spielberg started uh, to interview uh, survivors from the Holocaust. And he ended up interviewing worldwide about 70,000, which I didn't do them all. <laughs> Slacker. Uh, but, um, and we would, I would have about, I would meet with a survivor uh, one day prior to the interview, and I had about a 30 page questionnaire to fill out. And then um, the next day, we would meet the survivor, and I would interview, and the videographer would film. It was very, uh, it was an amazing experience. A lot of, I, I hardly ever interviewed anybody that didn't cry. And um, mm -hmm. at, when we finished with uh, survivors, then we started to interview um, servicemen that had been liberators of uh, camps. And that was the same way. They were so influenced by what they saw. So it was quite interesting. Yeah, I can, I can say that when we were building the ideas building, I walked around the very top on a six inch beam with no harness, no nothing like oh. that. <laughs> Amazing. I never look at that building without thinking about you. Wow. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, oh. Harry, would you still do that today? Would I still do what? Walk around the beam. Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> and what better way to conclude this highlight video than with our most unpredictable friend, Sandy, describing her first run-in with the Pacific Ocean just a few months after our graduation. And I can attest to the accuracy of her description because I was there and observed her struggle from a very unique vantage point. We were going to swim in the ocean for the first time. So we just, we wanted to do body surfing. So we went out there and we were body surfing for, I don't know how many hours. I loved water. I was totally unafraid, had no idea how an ocean functions. And all of a sudden I tried to pick up a wave and it got me and rolled me in. Well, I don't know what part of my body was touching the sand. It was like I was in a blender. <laughs> and it washed me up on shore, and I couldn't stand up. So I was trying to grab the sand, and I, all I could see was finger marks being dragged back out into the water. And then I got washed up again, and I still couldn't stand up. I, I was clawed my way back out there, and then I got the third time it washed me up, I got on my knees and crawled out of the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and I laid there, my feet were still where, the, still where the watermark was. I looked out there, and the beach there at Venice Beach is, is situated, so the sun in the west, it was late in the afternoon, it's behind, you know, it's, you're looking west. So the sun was directly behind this wall of water that these two little things were hanging in the top of that wall of water and one of them was Gary. And I was watching them thinking, oh my goodness, this is Are not you good, you know. Are you Are you and the, the lifeguard came yeah. by and he said, Are those your friends out yeah. there? And I said, Yeah. No. And he said, you gotta tell them to get out. I said, I can't tell them anything. I can't even stand up. <laughs> so he was motioning to him come in and he said that we're clearing the beach. He said it's dangerous out there today and I thought, no kidding. <laughs> So that was just 20 minutes of highlights from three and a half hours of enjoyable conversations. 
Some of us had not seen each other for a few months, or years, or decades. It was great fun. But remember, our 60-year reunion is just half finished. It continues in person the weekend of September 25th. Please make plans to attend.